<laughs> thought I would come come up like a mermaid. <laughs> I actually don't think it's a swimsuit. I think it's some kind of a like like for sexy dancing. I don't know, but I think it's like kind of. I was feeling it. I'll fill in it like this is cute. So, um, I only decided like you saw when I was in that ba the bathroom when I was sipping my coffee, which I have right here. And I'm like, I feel like going in the pool. So, okay, we're starting tonight right at a chapter. Um, not in the middle of another one like yesterday because. Chapter 45. Reputation is made in a moment. Character is built in a lifetime. Because of the great notoriety brought on by all the media, especially television, more people got to notice and know me Wherever I went, suddenly I became a celebrity. It got so that I couldn't go anywhere without being recognized. I'd get mobbed at the Bellagio where we usually played the big game. Just going from the poker room to the ballet would take an extra 10 or 20 minutes because I was besieged with fans who wanted to talk and pose for pictures with me. And of course, I was obliged to take a few minutes to accommodate them. Before John got me this book, I couldn't have picked him out of a lineup. I would have been like, who? What's his name? <laughs> uh, around the World Series was even worse. <laughs> Everyone wanted my time. Well, all this was flattering it got to be tiring. I could barely make it to the bathroom between the quick breaks in tournament play and get back in time when they started dealing again. I just get mobbed by all the fans. People would stop and speak to me in airports, restaurants, and casinos and always in a friendly way. Is it possible that, you see my foot. Is it, is it possible at all that they were like, oh, can you take a picture? Be like, oh, please, no pictures. And it's like, no, we want it of us. I can't go anywhere without being public. <laughs> we don't know who you are. <sighs> I feel like John would have recognized him, but I would not have. Uh, on one hand, I liked the attention, but for the most part, I just wanted to be left alone to play poker and to go about my business. I always try to remember who I really am and where I come from. I miss the days when I was just a poker player. I could barely get my thoughts around all the proposals that poured in, let alone handle them. They offered me video game deals and they wanted to make Doyle Brunson slot machines. I figured it would be good publicity for all my activities. So when you go into casinos now, you'll see slot machines with my picture on them. I, does anybody care? whose face is on a slot machine like wouldn't you just go like whatever's available would you be like no it has to be this one with this guy on it <laughs> why is 
Daniel Ban for saying, good to see you guys. You guys, I'm so sick of these glitches. Oh, it's probably because he's complaining that I'm reading. Is that it? Daniel, just listen to the book. I have to get through it because tomorrow we do a call-in show and I won't be reading till Sunday. I wish could, I couldn't see the comments. I can't really see anything from over here. Sorry. I'll, I will just stay on the book. <laughs> I go on the internet and see Doyle Brunson beer which I knew nothing about. I'd see Doyle Brunson t-shirts, Doyle Brunson caps, Doyle Brunson plaques, Doyle Brunson playing cards. I didn't know anything about a lot of those either. I certainly wasn't getting royalties on everything. get you wet. Do we see? Do we see uh, Gila's work in there? How can they use your likeness without paying? Um... I, I mean, I think I've heard something where if it's like an artistic, well, even then, I think if it's like a politician, there's like a spot. I don't know. <laughs> um, in one proposal, I was supposed to go to New York and play cards in the display window of a department store in a replica of a Doyle's room set using special Doyle Brunson chips. We got out of that one. There were a number of TV deals in the works and a major film company produced a movie on gambling and hired me as a consultant. I worked with the great actor Robert Duvall and even appeared in the movie Lucky You. In a cameo role, I got involved with more TV and film productions than I could count. Over the next few years, TV shows with all sorts of concepts sprung up like prairie weed. It seemed like every one of them wanted me as a part of them. There was that great professional poker league, which never saw fruition because the UIGEA legislation killed the advertising possibilities and ultimately the whole show. I don't, I can't see you guys. Maybe if I hire, would that help? I can't, is everything okay? Yeah. 
Should I just should I just sit my butt here? <laughs> You're fine. I got to see you guys anyway. Listen to the story. The great facility built by the Venetian for the ill-fated professional poker league was not wasted. They moved forward with another project I was working on called The Real Deal. the brainchild of Merv Adelson and some of Hollywood's heavy hitters who had access to the best directors and producers in the business. It was an audience participation kind of thing with people playing for prizes. There were some flaws in the concept and the show wound up getting canceled before it got into TV production. But for a while, it looked like an interesting bonding of poker and TV. Then someone came up with the idea of broadcasting live high stakes cash games. Mostly what had been shown were tournaments and they thought that cash games would make for good TV. They were right about that one. Okay, but what about like, like the countries? Because didn't like, like Bobby Fischer, he famously won against the Russians or something like the Eastern Bloc. Like, would it be like the best American players? Like, who's the best country, and who che and which country cheats the most? Oh my God, I was just going to say um, probably China because it, they say like in China that like when you're in the gaming sphere that they um, have like a lot of like hacks and, and stuff. So, um, but then it reminded me like, I guess that there was like a, a court decision today about like about, um, college admissions and divvying them up by race or something like I don't even follow that like but I do hear like with Asian people that like part of their culture like not everybody obviously but more I think than like me in my white trash background like where it's like do whatever with your life you know like <laughs> what did I do on OnlyFans today I hula hooped naked except for pantyhose on my bed <laughs> That's not the way of like <laughs> the tiger mom where it's like, because it's like a retirement plan that if you're your kid and you'll have maybe less of them. So you really focus on like, they have like a lot of like tutoring and extracurriculars and things so that they can get into like a good school, have a good career path and take care of mom and dad. <laughs> you know, it's part of the plan. <laughs> so it's like, there's a lot of pressure too. Like there, there are kids that would, you know, really go, go, depression if they couldn't get into like certain school where for me it's like what what is college I forget it's like college that's 12 years one year that's like what <laughs> I don't know <laughs> but um I guess in, in, in the world of college it's like a big deal sounds fun to watch Stella it's literally on my only fans Which was awesome, yeah. <laughs> no, I am not complaining that you were reading. I was just saying how much I like your swimsuit. Some guy said I was rude. Well, thank you, Daniel. Um, no, well, People can take it the wrong way because a lot of times people come on and they'll be weird. Like, what is she doing? What is she reading a book? And it's like, you know what? Shut up. I'm educating you. That's what Mark Living used to say.
in my arm. In my arm. I tried to show you an OnlyFans before the show, too. Did you see? I did a bunch of pictures in this that I was trying to show the back, how it has, like, it's like a not a detail, too. Should I just sit here? <laughs> Do you, you see in that that door? That's all Fila's work. All right, is everything good? We go back to reading. Daryl, Daryl, Daryl wrote me, why did you heat the pool if it's 108? It, cool, it could cool off overnight and wind and stuff. So I wanted extra warm, I have it 92. All right. By the way, have you seen Arthur? Arthur, did you get your medicine yet? We are worried about you. Oh yeah, they're trying to say everything they could do with the poker. High stakes poker was my kind of show, featuring a game where players could pull out as much money as they want, quit, when they want and add more money when they want. In other words, real poker. It was carried by GSN TV, the game show network. It wasn't that hard to convince me to play these games. A lot of the players on the show were better tournament players than cash game players. So it was easy pickings for me. I played 15 times on the show and won 15 times. I sometimes wonder how I came off a cotton farm in Texas and made it as a high stakes professional poker player. After playing on that show, I began to wonder less about it. I played the biggest pot ever on high stakes poker. It was against Cirque du Soleil billionaire Guy La Liberté. There was enough money in that pot, $818,100, to buy a luxury house with a custom pool. It was certainly an exciting hand. We both had a pair of aces, but I had the best kicker, so I won. I suspect that the smile they showed on TV while I was raking in that pot was genuine. La Liberté, a Canadian, visited the Bellagio one day and noticed his car parked there. It looked like it had an airplane engine in it. I've never seen a car like that before. So I asked Guy about it when I got to the poker room. There's only 50 of them, he said. How much did it cost? $1.4 million, he said flatly. My gosh, I said, I know they have, they don't have any garages to fix that car. What do you do if something happens to it? And I'm curious what the car is because because Terry knows his cars and I want to ask um what car it is if Terry knows what car that is oh I see Arthur what oh there you not yeah okay I'm sorry are are we still on for our um Paula Abdul duet tomorrow I have to practice two steps forward two steps back yeah <laughs> Uh, is there, I don't want to plop out of this. All right, we're good. We're good. Okay. Uh, oh, he said, I keep another one 
for a spare out in my garage. Things got to the point where you could turn on your TV any time in the evening, any night of the week, and see poker tournaments, poker shows, poker players being interviewed, or poker being talked about. And not just in the United States. Tournaments were springing up in countries I had barely heard of. Everywhere it seemed, people embraced our game with a passion. England? Well, I never heard of that one. Sweden? France? Oh, I heard of France. Australia? Denmark? And a host of other countries jumped into the game. With players flocking to online sites, live tournaments, and cash games wherever they could find them. Everyone had a chance. <laughs> I never heard of that. <laughs> Everyone had a chance. to live the dream and every year more and more players proved it could be done. I was getting all expenses paid invites to play tournaments around the country and all over the world. I took up some of these invitations playing in Ireland and the Philippines and England. But all those hours in the air in different time zones were tiring and took a toll on me. The power of television really struck home. People in Manila would point and shout my name. There's the poker player. I couldn't believe it. A casino had a poker tournament while I was there and I was the star attraction. The first European World Series of Poker Tournaments was held in London in 2007. And despite my resolve to travel less, Harris persuaded me to go. I had played the first World Series of Poker event in the United States back in 1970. And they said it was only fitting that I go to the first one in Europe. I didn't get very far in the tournament, but it did feel special to play in the inaugural European events. I was the only player there from the original six. Heck, I was about the only one of them still alive. Poker had become such a status symbol, or at least a cultural phenomenon. That movie stars musicians, models, and all sorts of celebrities wanted to get into the game. You see them playing in tournaments, getting involved in celebrity related events and just being part of all that was going on. They were making poker movies, looking at poker scripts, and just wanting to be part of it all. Besides Lucky You, I also got a small part in The Grand with Woody Harrelson. Didn't he say Woody Harrelson was connected with like some murder for his father? And I don't even know what this movie Lucky You. Well, his father was a hitman. Okay.
movie star Toby McGuire of Spider-Man fame. I haven't heard of him in a while. Like, I haven't heard his name. Is he still acting? Hold on. I'm going to do a lot. Hold on. nice <laughs> okay uh... okay so he became hooked on poker he started playing in some world series events and became an excellent poker player and we almost went into business together i met toby at the poker tournament and became good friends. It smells like smoke. Daryl, can you look up in my area if there's any fires? It smells, it smells strongly of not like barbecue, like burns. Um, embers, like, his Spider-Man movies gave him a lot of cachet in the production industry. And he was able to open the door to production people and get it on TV. Toby thought it would get really big. I think we even formed a company. Toby knew a lot of the rich poker players in Los Angeles that would put up $50,000 and that would bring in all the pros. They'd all come to play with these guys. It would be like waving a beef steak at an alligator. I know, I sure like beefsteak. <laughs> Unfortunately, the timing was bad. When Doyle's room decided to come back into the United States, it made the idea unfeasible for McGuire's people. When that happened, Toby's agent advised him not to move forward because it might be perceived in a bad light. So the idea never reached fruition. Leonardo DiCaprio was making a documentary, The 11th Hour, about the environmental situation. <laughs> the environmental <laughs> situation. And the problems we face. He was looking for sponsors and we decided to do it because he had done us some favors by wearing a Doyle's room cap, which got nationally publicized and really helped us out. We went down to Leo's suite and heard his presentation about the environment and why we should do it. He talked to us for about 15 minutes and then said, okay, we're in. Later, Leo was laughing about it. I've been in a lot of meetings, he said, but I've never seen anything like this one where a guy was presenting a project and would reach into his pocket and pull out this little billfold and write a check for $350,000. Leo just wasn't used to how gamblers did things. We took a percentage of Leo's documentary and thought it would be a bigger hit than it was. But we did recoup some of our money. I think we earned about 
27% of the film. I'm a loser on that deal. <laughs> you ever watch on um, Netflix? They have a, a series called, um, is it the movies that made us or something? Well, they do like a background on some like hit movies and like ones from the 80s. And the people um, that did Dirty Dancing, they talk about like getting points. Like they did like one movie, but the way that they got points on it and how it's distributed. So he could have, I mean, talk about gambling. He could have been a big winner in that. It really smells like smoke. I can't see anything you're saying, but maybe I should bring over the phone. Uh, okay. Much of my time was spent promoting Doyle's room in one way or another, and we were able to bring some interesting celebrities on board to play. We got Paris Hilton to play on Doyle's room for a bit, and while she backed out because of the legal ramifications, her sister Nikki is an avid poker player and plays on the site. She's a real sweet girl. Pamela Anderson also got involved for a while. In fact, we gave Pamela her own poker room, pamandersonpoker.com. She was doing quite well with it until they passed that stupid internet law, U-I-G-E-A. That scared everybody until they, uh, <laughs> they, her advisor suggested she pull out too. She was another surprise, a very personable lady. I had heard so many Pam Anderson stories and I was surprised to find out how nice she actually is. The trouble with meeting all the gorgeous gals is they tell me the same thing. You remind me of my grandfather. Ouch. I'm not even thinking of retirement, but someday I will have to pass the torch. Doyle's room is in the process of signing a group of young internet poker players who will be known as the Brunson 10. I've met a few of the early selections and they are great kids. They will be the future of the site along with our existing representatives. I'm sorry, I just wanted to see if you said anything about the smoke. There is a fire. It doesn't smell like hand sanitizer. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything, but it does smell like a fire. I put some pantyhose on. I was tempted, but then I put this on first. But I feel like this would be good with like a suntan. Times have really changed from the early days when I played poker. Once I was in New York for a news conference and an autograph photo party at ESPN's 
bar and restaurant in Times Square where people lined up to be photographed with me three decades earlier, having all of those photographers crowding around me would have meant only one thing, the police hauling me off to jail with my arms pulled back and my wrists handcuffed. More recently, I pounced on an interesting opportunity with a guy from France, David Benjamin. I bet him $150,000 that he couldn't break 90 from the back tees at Shadow Creek, a local golf course. He had a year to do it. He could barely get the club on the ball when we made the bet. So I thought it was the biggest luck I ever had on a bet. It's a tough course, and I just knew he didn't have much of a shot at improving enough to win the bet. An ex-tennis player, David, practiced ball for a year. By the time... The year rolled around, he had gotten so good, I could hardly believe it. I won the bet by one shot, but it was a miracle. I sweated it out right down to the last hole. I pocketed that money, but for a while, the game had come for the next bet, the next high stakes wager that would get my heart pumping yet again. I always like to keep my money in play. So I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, thank you. I don't know if I'm holding up good enough. Maybe I should wait. Um, yeah, it's just the girls, and I guess that's Todd in the bottom. He looks like he looks like Doyle as a kid. I don't know what you're. I don't know what you're saying. Check it around my house. No, it's not around my house, but. Try to get another chapter in. Chapter 40. Wow, look how, I wonder how many chapters there are. Chapter 46. I don't see any. Do you remember when the uh, uh, telephone pole lit on fire and I could see it? That was so scary because I thought it might go on my roof. That was like 2020 or something. Um, I, you could see the white like flickering. Okay. Let's see. Oh, I'm so excited because we're going to, I'm really excited for the next book we're going to do. I think it's called The Bird Has Flown. Okay. I think that there are 372 pages. So yeah, there's like a one page epilogue. And we're on, so that's 372, and we're on 337. So we're getting done. Okay. The best thing about the future is that it comes one day at a time. Different doctors have told me 
that my body, as badly as I treated it, must be programmed to last a hundred years or more. One said 125, <laughs> another said 100. So I settled on 120, which was a fair compromise, but my heart was healthy, like a hard working and tireless carburetor. That's probably because of the cleansing rapid flow of blood through my veins during pressure situations at the poker table or on the golf course. Yeah, I don't think it works like that. <laughs> well, okay, maybe not, but it sounds good to me. So it was kind of ironic when in January 2009, I got on a list of the 100 most likely people to die. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God, did they make lists like that? <laughs> oh my God, what? During that year, Mac Rodden, writing for the cinemablend.com website, listed me at 16th and gave me a 10% chance of expiring that year at 75 years old. Apparently, he didn't know my doctors had me pegged in at 120. He also didn't consider my good genes either. All 10 family members on my mom's side lived into their 90s, with three of them passing 100. I think I take after that side. At least that's where my family tells me I got this bald head. At first, I was a little upset with this ranking, even though the site was meant in jest. But then I got a phone call from Mac and we made a 10,000 to 1,000 bet about my demise. Naturally, I took the over and to Mac's credit, he said he hopes he loses. That made two of us. We decided to donate the winnings to the American Cancer Society. If I don't make it to 120, I'm planning on going out at the age of 102 in honor of the 10-2 poker hand that is named after me. So I think Mac made a bad bet, but that wasn't the only list I got on. As I approached my 75th birthday, I landed on the most unexpected and least likely list of all, the Jenny Wu Top 10 Sexiest Poker Players. <laughs> he may be older than dirt, Jenny said noting that the hottest old man on the planet is also the oldest man to ever appear on her top 10. Then Jenny added that way over the hill is much better than being six feet under it. Who was I to argue? While my heart was still beating soundly and I was still going strong, Life and death always have a way of making their own decisions. On April 6, 2009, I received a phone call from my nephew, Ken, and I could tell right away it wasn't good. Doyle, I've got some bad news. You might want to sit down. As Ken hesitated, trying to find the right words, my mind raced through the possibilities. I didn't think it was anything about Doyle's room, which had been an ongoing difficulty, or anyone in the immediate family. I probably would have been the first to hear that kind of news. After I ruled out those possibilities, my mind immediately raced to the phone call I'd received from Ken some 18 months before when he told me that Chip was gone. He had that same tone of voice and was pretty... I was pretty sure someone close to me had died, but who? Go ahead, Ken. Might as well get to it, I said, dreading the next words out of his mouth. There was some noise on the phone connection, interference, I guess, and it kind of magnified the stillness on the other end. 
of the line. It's Chip's son, Casey. He died a few hours ago. Looks like it might be some kind of drug overdose. I was in shock. Drugs again? With another person close to me getting the worst of it? I was angry and upset, knowing that nobody ever wins when drugs are involved. This time, my dear friend Chip's son was the victim. I was overwhelmed and just sat there not knowing what to think. This is uh, 2009, April. Was fentanyl a problem then, like it is now? You always hear it on the news, like, mixed with something. Um, um, they say, like, um, cocaine. Like, there was a, a spattering of, like, a lot of cocaine overdoses or deaths in like new york but people were saying oh that's because it was mixed with something else like it wasn't like if that wouldn't kill you i don't know i've never had cocaine i mean i've never had cigarettes you know <laughs> but um i i don't know what would have killed him maybe they say but i wonder if that was that fentanyl um casey was a bona fide major league baseball prospect and had a bright future ahead of him. When Chip died, Casey's drug problems really got out of hand. He couldn't handle his father's death and started taking more and more drugs. I think he was in and out of rehab about three different times. I wish I could have done something, but you just can't help people when they're not ready to be helped. I saw Casey two or three nights before he died when I was driving home from a poker game, Casey saw my Escalade with the Doyle's room sticker on it, and he yelled at me at a stoplight. We pulled over, and he gave me a big hug. It was just a few days later that he died. I felt guilty like I'd let Chip down, but I don't know what I could have done. I remember Casey got in some trouble, and David Chestnut, his attorney, got him off. I thought it would have been better for him to spend some time in jail instead, but it's hard to make that kind of choice for other people. It makes me sick just to think about all the people that have been lost to drugs. Must have been 15 or 20 people I was close to that died from drugs. What a waste. Everyone should have the privilege to grow old, gray hairs, wrinkles, the marks and grooves on your face. Life experiences are what put those lines and marks on a person's face. I know with mine, I have earned every one of them. Um, that's the end of that chapter. But, you know, I feel like the thing is with helping people, it's like, yeah, they, they have to be ready to be helped. But here's the thing, like when you're all like offering anybody advice or whatever, like, if you do it, because people will try to offer me advice sometimes, and if you do it in such a, a demeaning way, like nothing that person ever has done is right. They're like literally retarded. Can I still say that word? <laughs> like that's how I feel like people might treat me. Like, did you know that donuts have sugar and sugar is bad? Um, <laughs> sorry, but like. I don't know. I mean, I've never had to like host an intervention or something, but I feel like each person you should tailor it to them and incentivize them, you know, maybe get a bet. Like I bet you won't die of a drug overdose chip. What was it then? Casey. Chapter 47, the best vitamin for making friends. Oh my God. It said B1. But I thought it said BJ. And I was like, what? <laughs> what are you guys doing? Casey's death got me thinking how fragile life is. I remember not long ago when we'd be in the car and past those wind towers in West Texas. They were maybe 200 feet high and produced lots of electricity. The landscape was dotted with them. I watch all those big blades turn round and round and wonder how much electricity each one of them produced. Somehow they just fascinated me. 
and it seemed like I could watch them forever. They became a part of the fabric of my memories and their familiarity gave me comfort. Now, every time one of my friends died, I feel like one of those wind towers had stopped forever. They stop all the time. I I literally live in the desert that like famously has them. Those they break like when you see them coming in, there's always a bunch of them that stop. They have to like, you know, sometimes it's birds that go into them or whatever. image would just sit there in my mind. A dead wind tower among a field of live ones, its tall structure reduced to a piece of empty steel, and a piece of me would just feel hollow inside. With the passing of each friend, I started reflecting on things. The young, the longer you live, the more friends you're going to lose. I guess that's just the way it is. But it's disheartening that these losses have escalated so much in the last few years. The death of Jamie Thompson at age 60 was reminiscent of Chip's passing. In fact, it was Chip who called me and said, can you believe Jamie Thompson died last night? He'd gone to the hospital emergency room for a kidney stone problem, but it was a heart problem that killed him. Jamie was a very close friend, a former All-American basketball player at Wichita State, and still a scratch golfer at the time of his death in 2007. At six foot three and big, but not overweight, he was a mountain of a man who played golf almost every day. Soon after I first met him on the golf course, I discovered Jamie didn't have one ounce of choke in him. So I took him as a golfing partner when I could. I found out later that he had refused money from my opponents to deliberately lose. It's hard to find a loyal and honest friend like that. I have trouble believing so many big, strong, healthy guys have heart problems. I wonder if the medications they give these men have something to do with this. They're dying, but death and life itself is a strange and difficult thing to comprehend in the first place. I think um I think hormones, hormone regulation, hormone systems are gonna be found like as cancer research moves farther ahead, which I always say I hope with AI. Um you know so it could be medicines and it, how it interacts with that. It could be um, the water in your area, because it's not even just hormones you take in, but it could be something that triggers that in what you're eating or yourself or stress. Um, they, you know, like there's like good hormones and, and there's like being in the right, the right flow, you know? But I, I think that that's, a lot of them. I mean, obviously, like there's um, the direct ties that we're very aware of to cancer. Yes, but I'm just saying, in terms of if he's saying, "Oh, there's an awful lot," like that's a guess I have. I try not to dwell too much on the people who have passed, but on the gifts that life has given me. I've been blessed with a wonderful family and more interesting people, good and great friends than any man could ask for. I think there were a half dozen or so guys in my life that I would distinguish as my best friends. DC Andrews was probably my best friend when I was growing up with Riley Cross a close second. 
that was right up through high school. Then I met Raymond Hibbler in college, and he was my best friend for a period of time. We were roommates in college and have stayed in touch, still talking on the phone several times a year. When I first started gambling, Wayne Hamilton was a guy I ran with for four or five years until he died. I didn't feel as close to him as the rest of my best friends, but we spent a lot of time together. When I came to Vegas, there was Jack Binion, my longest running best friend. We met back in 1969 at the Texas Gamblers reunion in Reno. I can always depend on Jack. If I need help and he knows I would do anything to help him. Jack has been extra special in my life. He is, without question, the best friend a guy could ever have. He's always been there for me financially as well as spiritually through thick and thin, triumph and tragedy. He loaned me $2 million when I was in that television station fiasco and never even mentioned a note or collateral. And contrary to my near perfect losing investment record, I successfully invested with Jack in his company that operated Riverboat Casinos. in several states, <laughs> it was the best investment I ever made and maybe the only one that ever made me money. My other really close friend was Chip Reese. Chip was in the everyday mix of gambling. He was always at the poker game and when the games broke up, we would go places. In 1991, he became the youngest member enshrined in the Poker Hall of Fame. He was there for me when my daughter died. He saw how distraught I was. And he was part of my religious support group, even joining me in reading the Bible, Christian literature, and the prophecies in my very darkest moments, including those times when I briefly contemplated suicide, which he may well have sensed. Chip put aside everything to help me. I believe with all of my heart I would be he would be with me the rest of my life. I was wrong. There was also Sailor for so many, many memorable years and Mike Caro, both of whom enriched me in countless ways. My traveling partner Slim would have to be mentioned also along with Dewey Tonto and Doug Dalton. Doug, the card room manager at the Bellagio, is a longtime friend we spend many new years together, and he was always there when I needed him. Back in the 80s, I owned a card room in Oceanside, California with Chip and a fellow named Len Miller, and Doug came out from Vegas to run it for us. They say if you can count on your good, your good friends on both hands, you're lucky. Well, I've been very lucky by that definition or really any definition. I've been fortunate to have hundreds. I've played poker with countless people and I become good friends with many of them. While most of the interesting characters I knew were gamblers, Harry Claiborne, a friend of mine for years, was a notable exception. A flamboyant defense lawyer, prosecutor, federal judge, and longtime friend. 
Harry was the assistant district attorney who tried and convicted Benny Binion and then went to work for him when Benny got out of jail. After Benny hired him to be his personal attorney, Harry could usually be found in the Binion booth at the horseshoe telling stories. We had a roast once for Jack Binion in Louisiana, and Harry flew a private plane down there with Chip and me. All three of us spoke at the roast, but Harry was in a class by himself when it came to public speaking. He was an amazing storyteller and orator, eloquent and engaging. It was simply a joy to listen to his stories. At one time, Harry was among the great high profile defense lawyers in Nevada. He represented Rat Packers, Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra when they applied for gaming licenses in Vegas. One of my favorite Harry stories occurred when he was 75, a 75 year old federal judge. A 65 year old drug dealer appeared before him for sentencing and appealed for mercy, claiming poor health. Harry was not remotely sympathetic, sentencing him to 25 years in prison with no possibility of parole. That's too long, the dealer whined. I can't make it that long. I'll die before I get out. I know, son, Harry replied. Just do what you can. <laughs> oh, my God. Harry was convicted of tax evasion and impeached in 1986 by the U.S. House of Representatives, the first federal judge to be sent to prison. He served 17 months of a two-year sentence about a decade later, battling cancer and Alzheimer's, Harry killed himself at age 86. I've also been extra privileged to have Louise, my very special wife, who has put up with me for all of these years and has been the most wonderful wife a man could possibly have. She's given me four or five children She's been a terrific companion for almost half a century and has been by my side through the best and worst of times. She's one in a zillion. I'm in card rooms all the time and I see these guys get calls from their wives and girlfriends. But in 40 something years, Louise never called me while I was playing poker unless it was an emergency. She did have difficulty grasping how focused I became during a month-long tournament or an extended high-stakes poker game. I concentrated so hard that I would actually feel as though a heavy weight lay between my eyes, and I tended to block everything from my mind except the game. She would talk to me, and I wouldn't hear her, and even afterward, it took me a few days to wind down. She didn't cope with that very well, but that's understandable. She could have burdened me with guilt and regrets for my absences and preoccupation, for shirking family responsibilities in ways little and big, but she never did. It takes a special woman to be with a poker player, not just the time apart, which could be as long as three or four weeks at a time, but the mood swings that inevitably occur in this profession. I think my dad and my brother would have been proud and pleased that I've had a successful gambling career. My sister Lovada would never be labeled a gambling fan, but I think she's proud of my accomplishments. I don't think my mother would have cared much either way because worldly things, monetary things never meant much to her. Understand that for more than 50 years, pretty much all I have done is look for a good poker game or a new golf course, or at least it seems that way. I've had three remarkable children, daughters Doyla and Pam and son Todd, and a lovely and very special stepdaughter, Cheryl. Cheryl is the spitting image of her mother, drop dead gorgeous and a little Southern belle, an extrovert who, as we say in Texas, never meets a stranger. She has used her 
friendly and outgoing personality in public relations and marketing. For a few years, she even dabbled in the poker world, running satellite tournaments at the World Series. When Louise was having her health problems and the kids were growing up, her daughter Cheryl quit her job in Texas and moved to Las Vegas to lend a hand with her younger siblings. It was one of the nicest things imaginable. She showed up expecting three kids, but found five. Two friends of Todd and Pam were staying with us at the same time because of problems at their homes. Our house was always the kid-friendly place with neighborhood children in and out all the time. I remember it being tough to sleep with all that noise. I don't know what we would have done without Cheryl. I think I might have to stop soon. I mean, I have uh, just on like a page or so in this chapter, but I, I bet we're finished like one more day or so um, for this book. You can see the light on now. Um, I'm really looking forward to the next book um, because it, I like women writers, women's perspective. We like the singer. I think it'll be like even like romance and from a woman's perspective, that should be fun. Um, I feel reading this book, like so glad for his children that he's left this behind now that he's passed away. Like what a beautiful like tribute to his life. And then he got to have this be like years before and then go on doing whatever. But I feel like, he, like, He's done such a good job. I mean, you can't totally follow his life now to the end because, I mean, not in order because he like jumps around a bit sometimes, which I, I find like fun, you know, to follow that way. But um, I'm not feeling like as sad, I think, because it, you do get the sense that he felt fulfilled in his life. Like he missed people and that he had ultimately felt like he did stuff, stuff to be proud of and he was proud of his family. So. Trying to read what you guys are saying, but I have trouble. Thanks for sticking around. Um, did you like this uh, surprise out here? Should I do photos on OnlyFans after with the the bathing suit wet? Um, I'll take it off. <laughs> um, yeah, but I'm really liking this book. We're really close to being done. So definitely next week, new book. I know John's not going to be around tomorrow or Saturday. I think it's just this week. Um, but um, I look forward to just talking to the rest of you tomorrow. And when he gets back, um, I'm a little bit hungry, but I hope you had fun. Our pool stream. Uh, I don't smell a smoke anymore. I think maybe it went away. But I love you.